Welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 238 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Ayalon, CEO of Greek University. I'm a speaker and a two-time author. Our second book, From Letters to Leaders, Redefining New Member Education and Leveraging Belonging to Eliminate Hazing, is now at Amazon. Go and pick up that book today. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there's nothing like great food to bring college students together. Fun fact, today's college students, Gen Z, they want to make this world a better place. They want to give back to their communities. We have a unique opportunity right now to invite other college students with us to do community service as opposed to the typical recruitment events that merely focus on, let's say, the social aspects of college life. If we can work shoulder to shoulder with another student to improve our local community, I promise you the bonds that you will build with these potential new members will quickly turn them from a general college student to fraternity and sorority members that are committed to making this world a better place together. So I encourage you to look for those kinds of opportunities. And along those same lines, our next guest is David Crocker. Most people believe that serving other people is a nice thing to do but it doesn't really make any difference. David knows that serving others is an overlooked but powerful change agent to make our communities better places to live. He knows that there is no area of life that a serving mindset cannot improve. Having worked with thousands of people over 15 years, motivating and equipping them to serve other people, David is considered an expert in this field. His work spans 25 states, four countries and continues to spread worldwide. He's appeared on WRAL TV. He's uh, appeared on WBIR TV, WATE TV, uh, various radio and published numerous articles. I can't wait to talk more. Welcome to the show, David Crocker. Thank you, Michael. It's good to be with you today. It's great to be with you. I love talking community service. So, you know, when I saw that this is really what you focus on and this is what you're an expert in, I was like, let's have David on the show. This has been fantastic. So I want to make sure that our listeners know a little bit more about you. You've been a senior pastor of churches in several states for 30 years. In 2007, you launched what is the faith-based nonprofit operation in the Samuch Incorporated and through which you equipped over 2,300 congregations in 25 states and four countries with the in as much model of compassion ministry. Tell our audience, what is this model all about? Well, the first thing I would say is, uh, as someone might, as some of your uh, listeners might possibly figure out, the word in as much comes from the um, verse, Matthew 25, 40, where Jesus said, in as much as you've done it to the least of these, you've done it to me. Uh, that is a uh, clarion call, I think, for us to serve people with whatever kind of needs they may have uh, who are around us. So that's the basis of it. The model itself was developed um, actually about 27 years ago in a church that I was serving in North Carolina at the time. We didn't have any other models to go on. We just kind of did our own thing. But it worked so well, it began to spread to other churches, and uh, because that was a military community, Fayetteville, North Carolina, where Fort Bragg is, uh, and that's, by the way, where the word operation comes from, because that clearly communicates in a uh, military community, but also a civilian one, uh, it, it's been spread uh, far and wide, and then when we uh, established the ministry, the self-sustaining standalone ministry of operation in as much in 07, it really grew exponentially uh, after that. So what this does is it equips groups, primarily churches, but not exclusively, to mobilize their members, be they church members, fraternity members, uh, business uh, employees, whatever, to get out in their community and serve people in need. A lot of people ask, well, what kind of needs? And I say, well, fill in the blank because it, it really is not limited to any particular kind of need. We do not come in with a slate of needs and say, okay, go out there and find where these needs exist and try to help those people. This is customizable for groups and communities. Every group is different, every community is different. And so we have left it kind of open-ended like that. 
but it's been hugely successful in so many places. So gratifying to get reports back uh, from these groups saying this is one of the best things that has ever happened to our church or to our group. And by the way, we did work with the fraternity uh, here in Knoxville, Tennessee, where I live, uh, at the University of Tennessee, mm-hmm. and had a really positive experience a few years ago. That's fantastic. Yeah, there's a great fraternity and sorority community right there in Knoxville that you can take advantage of because really, you know, community service is one of the founding principles of our fraternities and sororities. So I think that is your way in is to say, listen, you took an oath when you joined your fraternity or sorority. So let's start talking about that oath and what that really means in terms of your actions, not just what you say in the front of the room, what your organization is about, but what you actually do. And so many of the fraternity and sorority members who are listening right now, they are doing community service, but they might not be thinking about what they are doing and the transformational power of serving other humans. So why do you think, in your opinion, you're an expert in this, why does the world need this community service now more than ever? Michael, the short answer to that is unfortunately, needs are not going away. They're only increasing. For example, the situation we see in Ukraine, Hmm. the whole world is focused on that right now. Hmm. And that is an unusual situation, but we have numerous natural disasters all around the world. And in the aftermath of every one of those, there's enormous need. And then there's the ongoing needs of poverty and child abuse. And I mean, you can just go on and on and name uh, all those needs. So I would say that The reason why we need this more than ever is because the needs are continuing to grow. So we need more people who are ready and willing to respond to those needs as best they can. Mm -hmm. But there's one other answer that I would give to that. And that really focuses mostly on our culture here in America. I don't think I would get a lot of argument if I were to say that um, our culture is broken or at least divided. We are divided in a variety of ways, uh, more than we have ever been. It seems that uh, more people are against something than they're for something. Uh, I I ran across a term in doing some research for the book uh, that I really like because I think it describes what is happening that is contributing as much uh, as anything to this division, and that's otherizing. It means that we treat other people as non-humans. Uh, they may have an opinion, we, ha- we have an opinion about their opinion, but now people are more suspect about people's motives uh, and uh, things like alternative truths and, you know, we can't trust uh, the old reliable sources for, in- for information anymore. So everything is up for questioning. So serving is the antithesis of this concept of otherizing or divisiveness. When I serve someone else, I build a bridge to that person. Now, it may not be a four-lane bridge. It may be a one-path bridge uh, because our encounter is fairly brief, but it's a bridge nevertheless. And one of the ways that we can make our communities a better place to live where we're not described anymore by our divisiveness is the unifying effect we get with serving. It simply brings people together. Mm. Let me tell you a really quick story. It's one of the best I've heard. My wife introduced me to a Nashville, Tennessee police officer by the name of Jason. Jason was given the assignment along with the team around him of police officers to go into one of the most crime riddled areas of Nashville. The residents there refer to it as the jungle. That's what the people who live there call it. So Mm. that tells you a lot about what it's like. They, they, their assignment was to change the perception of law enforcement in that community. Pretty tall order. But Jason got his team together initially and he said, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to serve these people. So instead of just walking the beat through those neighborhoods, uh, driving their police cars through there, they got out and spent time talking to the people to find out what some of the needs were. They found a man who was sleeping on the floor because he did not have a bed. They got him a bed. They found a woman who needed help in getting to her uh, employment, uh, and they rounded up some money and got her a car so she could get to her her job. Uh, They found people who had inadequate food, 
And so they got churches involved to provide food. Over a period of time, just a few months, the attitude of the people in that neighborhood totally changed toward those officers. And uh, Jason told me in sharing this story, he said, we knew we had reached our objective when there was a shooting in the neighborhood, which by the way, is not at all uncommon, mm. but there was a shooting and involved drugs. And when the other police officers came in, the, the residents wouldn't talk to them. But when we came in, we had the credibility and they told us who did the shooting, where the drugs were and anything else we needed to know. Mm -hmm. So my point is, even if there are walls between groups of people, those walls can, in fact, be broken down, and serving does that as well or better than anything. Man, you, that's a great story. I really, really like that story. And I draw some comparisons in my own experiences. Um, as you know, I mean, you know, we are divided. One of the ways we're divided, unfortunately, right now is in politics. I mean, you and I remember a day when we used to watch Dan Rather on the news and, and he was the guy, you know, you had one of maybe three choices, right? CBS, NBC, ABC, and that was it. And now, you know, the spectrum of news, I mean, boy, oh boy, you've got 2,000 choices and everybody is catering to one specific view and you almost get this feedback loop of hearing the same things over and over again. I was speaking in New York, uh, which is typically a, a liberal state. Of course, I live in Tennessee, you know, where you live as well. Uh, but I was speaking in New York and I remember a woman came up to me. She was a sorority woman. And she came up to me after the program and she said, Mike, she said, a lot of my, our members in the sorority, they're very liberal, you know, we're in New York, of course, and I understood that. And she said, but, you know, she said, I'm a Republican and, and I can't even express my views in my own sorority because they basically said that I have to keep quiet. I can't express my views because that's going to alienate potential new members that are coming into the organization and they won't want to join us because one person in the organization has a different viewpoint. And I'm saying to myself, man, where are we? Like, what is happening here? And I, and that was, I had the same answer that, you know, that you had for the Nashville police, which is just do service. It's the one thing that we can all agree on. And I think after that service event, I think you're going to build a bridge to some of the others in the organization and just say, hey, we did a really good thing today. Don't we all feel really good about the, the positive change that we brought into this community? And so I guess that kind of leads me into the next question, which is, you know, you wrote this book. Uh, it's called Compassionaries Unleash the Power of Serving, which I think is fantastic for fraternity and sorority members to pick up. And you talked about an increase in the number of people who are serving others during the pandemic. And you mentioned the war in Ukraine. It does seem like there are lots of U.S. citizens, other people all over the world that are going into the Ukraine to assist with handing out food. They're assisting with training in terms of military training, because a lot of these people are not military people. They're just ordinary citizens trying to fight against somebody else coming into their country and redefining their borders. Um, and so... You know, do you think that, you know, forget about Ukraine, right? I, I hope and pray that, that that ends, that that conflict ends. I really do hope for peace there. Um, do you think that this trend of service to others will continue to grow uh, with the current generation, Gen Z, and then the new generations after them? Once this whole Ukraine thing is, is put to bed, hopefully soon, will this just continue in terms of service in the future? I'm very hopeful that it will, but... I can't honestly say that I think it will, and here's why. Uh, we, we often see strong response to major issues that um, uh, hit the news cycle and stay in front of us day after day after day, or a hurricane, or an earthquake, or whatever the situation may be. And, and I kind of, I, I refer to these, or at least I think of them as more of a reactionary kind of thing. Doesn't mean it's not worthwhile. Mm -hmm. any, any manner in which a person helps another person because of the need uh, that that person has uh, is, is valid, I think. So I, I'm not in any way suggesting it's not valid. I, I do, however, think that uh, we, have to, we have to figure out why we're serving. Uh, is it about the immediate need or is it about a, a, a bigger need that we have to make the world a better place. And I think in order to do that, that's a bigger goal, a lot bigger goal. And we have to develop a serving mindset. And quite frankly, Michael, 
that's one of the major reasons for writing the book. I've tried to write about it serving in such a way that people are led to think more deeply about it and first of all, be more effective when they do serve, but secondly, uh, get have a richer personal experience, not just a helper's high. Nothing wrong with that, that's a good thing, but let's go beyond that. Let's go beyond uh, just feeling good for a short period of time. And um, with that mindset, I think there is a better chance. I ran across an interesting uh, statistic. Uh, about everything has been studied these days, including you know, why people serve, the circumstances in which they serve. The thing I found was that retired folk who you would think would be more involved in serving because they have more time are not necessarily any more involved than they were prior to retirement. Hmm. What that seems to suggest is unless they have developed a pattern of serving before that, they're not going to be any more likely to serve afterwards than they do before. So that suggests a lot about in earlier in our life developing that mindset, developing that pattern. Uh, what I try to encourage people to do is make a firm commitment to be a compassionary. And in other words, every single day, be alert for some opportunity to serve others. Mm. Uh, not every day something will come along, but a whole lot of the days will. Mm. There are a lot of opportunities that go by us and we don't know. Mm. So that sort of situation, I think, offers a great deal of hope. And of course, I'm hoping Gen Z would influence uh, my generation, baby boomers, uh, and other others to do that. Yeah, that's a great answer. And uh, man, I hope, but I think that's another reason why I think I believe in fraternities and sororities is because it does introduce this concept of service at a young age, at 17, 18, 19 years old, uh, which I think you're right. I think we need to put the focus there. And if we can get them in that habit over four years while they're in college, right then they're much more likely to continue that into the workforce and then when they're retired, but we gotta start them young. Um, so talk to us, I mean, you know, your book is great, Compassionaries. I've also read Servant Leadership by Robert Greenleaf. That's another really good one that also explains some of the benefits, but tell us what are the benefits of serving to the students and the organizations who serve, for example, fraternities and sororities? Like why should they do this? What is the benefit? Well, the most obvious benefit is something I've already referred to, and that's the, the helper's high. We literally have a mood enhancement, a feeling of joy, feel, just a feeling of satisfaction when we serve. And the reason for that, I find most interesting. We are, Michael, literally hardwired to serve. And what I mean is there are areas of our brains that are stimulated when we serve so that oxytocin, serotonin and other boost in uh, mood enhancing uh, hormones within the body are actually uh, enhanced and they're released. At the same time, and this is really interesting, at the very same time, those hormones that tend to cause us to feel sad or depressed are actually reduced. So you get the good going up and the bad going down. So that's, uh, that's pretty good right there. That's what I would describe as more of a biological type of benefit. But also, uh, our relationships with others are strengthened. Uh, you, may, you used a phrase a while ago that I don't often hear, but I use it a lot, and that is working shoulder to shoulder. Yes. I heard someone say uh, some time ago, we actually get to know each other better shoulder to shoulder than we do face to face. And That's I really cool. believe that. I see yeah. it happen all the time. People go out on these um, uh, compassion uh, projects and they come back and they say, hey, I got to know so-and-so over here. I didn't even know them before. I heard that comment just two days ago by someone who participated in one of our food packing events. Didn't surprise me at all. A third benefit is it enhances our sense of purpose. Um, I don't often quote Goldie Hawn, <laughs> but... Uh, but here she did say uh, something that is quote is uh, worth quoting: a purpose-driven life is better. It makes you happier. And and she was saying serving gives us a stronger sense of purpose. And I could I could elaborate on that for more time than we have uh, here for this podcast. But um, it it really does work. But I want to add one more thing that I really believe is important when you talk about the benefits. Uh, everything that I've said is a benefit to the person serving. 
Let me talk for just a minute about benefit to people being served. When we serve people, we give them hope. We not only give them help for their immediate need, but we give them hope because we have demonstrated that we care. And when we care about someone, the person about whom we care is encouraged. They're, they're lifted up. And it's people who have hope who do things to help themselves. A, a quick story about that. So um, in Fayetteville, North Carolina, where Operation In As Much began, uh, we were go preparing for one of our events, went into a neighborhood that was crime ridden, uh, lots of uh, illiteracy, uh, prostitution, drugs, you name it. Went in there at, at the uh, advice not to do so by some of the city leaders, but we went in and found about two dozen projects to, uh, to work on their homes, to, to better their homes. A lot of people said no because a lot of promises had been made to them and broken, but we, we hung in there, uh, we got the projects, uh, a virtual army of church people from different denominations, which is a beautiful thing, moved in there and, and helped all of these people uh, on the Saturday. One week later, the uh, teachers, some of the teachers from the Fayetteville Tech Community College went in that same community as they had done a number of times before to teach people how to read and write. Four times as many people showed up on that day. And they said it was because the church people were there the week before. So what happens is when we help people, when we serve them, we give them hope, and then they're motivated to do things we'd all like to see them do to help themselves. So it, the help and hope go together, and any of these fraternity and sorority students that get out there, they may not think about it, but I wish they would, because I think that is transformational for the individual serving as well. So. Uh, that's a, a documented way that uh, we, we have benefits. Wow, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for that answer. And I do think that college students today, I mean, think about how privileged, you know, we, you know, and the students are on a college campus, um, you know, higher education, higher learning. Uh, we have an obligation to kind of pay it forward and make our communities better. Um, so, you know, I think about that obligation very often uh, when I when I look out on a college campus and what our responsibility is. And I love that quote that you said, you know, basically saying you can get to know somebody better shoulder to shoulder than face to face. I mean, that right there is gold. Uh, you know, I talk about that all the time. I talk about these recruitment events where we're trying to get new people to join our organization. And the college students, you know, the default is, well, let's have a social event. You know, we're going to we're going to have they call it steaks and stogies. Right. We're going to have steaks and we're going to have cigars. And I'm like, all right, you know, listen, I, I, I can I understand a good steak. Right. I, I totally get it. Right. But at the end of the day, I said, that's the face to face social stuff. You know, you can make the world a better place when you're working shoulder to shoulder. And I would argue you would get to know them better shoulder to shoulder. And I think your quote really perfectly sums it up. And I think I'm gonna use that going forward because really what you wanna do is get to know them on a deep level, have almost a spiritual experience with them of making the community better, realizing just how privileged we are in life and what our obligation is in making the world a better place. And I, I don't think you can build better bonds than that. I, I don't yeah. think there is a way. I mean, to, you know, to have alcohol and, and fall flat on your face together, I mean, I might not even remember that the next day, but if we're working shoulder to shoulder, I promise you I'm going to remember that the next yeah, day. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's really what I'm getting at. You know, I, you're the expert in community service. It, are you seeing common characteristics of those who serve? I do. Um, I, have, I did some research on that, and I found various lists. There was some overlap. Here's the list that I offer in the book. I think it begins with humility simply putting another person before self. I really like C.S. Lewis's quote, um, where he said, humility is not thinking uh, less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Uh, and that, that will, uh, being a pastor, that'll preach. <laughs> sure. Anyway, okay, so it begins with humility. Then seeing a need. I think that's uh, critical. Just recognizing we all have developed an ability to walk past needs. Uh, we're too busy at the moment. 
Um, we'd rather not see it. It makes us feel guilty. A lot of reasons for doing that. But stopping and really just seeing the need, honestly, is a, a major part of that. Uh, unfortunately, most of us don't travel in the areas of our communities where needs are more obvious. Uh, so sometimes we may need to drive through some of those neighborhoods and see what things are like. Um, a, a third characteristic uh, would be compassion. You would think that would be one of the first ones, of course. And by the way, compassion is not the same thing as pity. Pity doesn't lead to action. C compassion does. It's really genuinely caring for another person, whether or not we know them. Yeah. Uh, a fourth characteristic then would also be um, a, a sense of responsibility. You were just mentioning that, feeling like, okay, I, I heard, a, heard a saying just the other day that I really like and I'm going to use a lot. I, and you might like it too. It says, it's not good to do nothing when something needs to be done. It's not good to do nothing when something needs to be done. That's what That expresses that sense of responsibility. And the last characteristic is courage. And some people might find that a kind of an interesting, what, what's courage got to do with it? Well, sometimes we are moved out of our comfort zone when we help someone else. And uh, that doesn't take a lot of courage, but it takes some. Um, sometimes we get, we find ourselves in circumstances that are more than just uncomfortable. There can even be some danger involved. And uh, it takes some courage to be able to push through that, to be able to help the person uh, who is on the other side of that danger. So those are some of the traits that I have identified in the book as uh, traits of a compassionary or traits of a person who serves. I love it. What are some of the challenges that you're seeing of serving? Well, there are a lot of challenges. Um, one, uh, a lot of people probably would not identify as a challenge, but it's ingratitude. You know, we kind of expect when we help somebody else for them to at least say thank you. And uh, that doesn't always happen. Uh, sometimes uh, people receive whatever help we offer and they kind of go on their way and we're left standing there. Well, gee, I would have expected, but you know what? In some cases, people are resentful that they are in a circumstance that forces them to ask for or simply receive help. And there may also be a sense of shame. So uh, I think it's important that we try to recognize that. And by the way, if we're really doing it for the thank you, we probably have the wrong motive anyway. So that's one thing, being taken advantage of. We've all been in circumstances, those of us who've done very much helping, where people didn't tell us the truth. And based on some dishonesty, they received some help from us. And it's it's just natural, I think, for us to um, be un, un, uh, dissatisfied with that. Uh, but you know, we need to give ourselves a little slack here. Nobody gets it right all the time, mm -hmm. so it's okay. Uh, so what if we're taken advantage of once or twice? Um, I'd rather have that and know that I've at least tried to help. And by the way, God looks at the the heart of the servant, not so much the outcome of the service. Uh, so anyway, the, the last thing would be enabling. Uh, we'd like to be able to help someone and um, just kind of do what needs to be done and, and, and then for it not to become too complicated. But unfortunately, that's not the case sometimes. Um, we've all had the experience of approaching uh, someone who's asking for money, holding a sign, homeless, hungry, can you help or whatever. I will say that my favorite sign like that was in Indianapolis, Indiana, where a guy said, I'm not going to lie, it's for beer. <laughs> mm -hmm. I've seen at least one. he was almost willing to give him money just because he was honest. He was honest. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, we don't want to, we don't want to uh, enable people. So in the book, I've included a little test that I ran across and I'll just, uh, just kind of share this quickly. We ask ourselves these questions. Are my actions helping this person to feel more self-empowered? What we want is for a person's immediate need to be met, but also uh, to have participated in that help. Uh, that requires a little more investment of time, maybe, uh, a little more wisdom, but it's more helpful. Are his circumstances staying the same, worsening, or improving? Is this person doing the absolute best to help himself? Are my actions motivated by fear, pity, guilt, what good has come from my help? 
what harm has come from my help? Just those last two might be enough. What good has come, what harm has come? And uh, again, that requires a little more reflection um, and it does complicate uh, circumstance of serving someone else. But after all, we would really like to make a long lasting difference in someone's life, not just help them for um, today. There is so much need out there right now. I mean, we talked about, you know, a couple of them, certainly the Ukraine, uh, they, they certainly you know, could use some help right now. But how can today's student organizations determine which organization in their community is the best one in the community to serve? Well, I think the first answer to that would be, I'm not sure there is one best one. There are probably several good ones. Um, certainly research can be done pretty easily online about most any nonprofit. Uh, just Google it and, and find out what their mission is and how effective they are. Uh, you can actually uh, find out about uh, how much of the donations they receive, monetary donations, uh, what percentage goes to help people and what is uh, kept in hand. Um, um, I'm, I'm blanking right now on the, you may know it, Michael, the, um, the uh, website that uh, provides that. Um, I'll think of it in a minute. Yep. The other thing I would say is if, if the organization, if the fraternity or sorority have already, for some reason, sort of identified a particular need that they would feel drawn toward, uh, then, of course, seeking out organizations that are already in the business of meeting that need is a really good thing to do. Uh, you can maximize your effort and your time by partnering with an existing nonprofit. Uh, they know where the people are with those needs. They know the best ways to meet those needs uh, rather than reinventing the wheel and trying to start from scratch and do your own thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so see if there's something that they're drawn to um, and uh, do a little research on the organizations as to what seems to be a good fit in that way. Yeah, guidestar.org is the website. That's it, Guidestar. Thank you. <laughs> we think alike. I know, I know what you were referring to. You started describing it. I'm like, I bet you he's thinking about Guidestar. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's really great. Do you have any other ideas on how students can use service opportunities to attract more like-minded students into their organization? Well, I think there are two things. One is to make sure what they do in the way of service gets put on social media. I suspect it usually is, but uh, be very intentional about that. Mm -hmm. But the very best way is something you've already said, and that is uh, just invite those students to come serve with them. Yeah. When I'm working with a church group, I say to them, don't confine yourself to your members as people who can participate in this. Look around in the community uh, at people who have certain skills in particular that you may need, and you may be very surprised, pleasantly surprised, at how many of those people will come right along beside you and work with you. And guess what? They're going to find out in the meantime that uh, these church people aren't quite so scary. <laughs> you never know, they may come back. And so the same thing can work with a fraternity or a sorority. Invite them to, hey, we're gonna go down to uh, the homeless shelter and, and serve a meal. You wanna go? Mm -hmm. uh, two hours of your time or something like that. that man, that, that works. That yeah. absolutely works. Yeah, I agree with you. I got my uh, copy here of Servant Leadership by Robert Greenleaf and Stephen Covey wrote the foreword in the book. And he talks about, he said, uh, while imprisoned in the death camps of Nazi Germany, Dr. Viktor Frankl, who also wrote a really good book as well, he first asks himself the question, what is it that I want? But gradually he submitted himself to his higher nature, to his conscience, and changed the question to, what is wanted of me? This totally changed his world. I mean, Absolutely. you know, that's yeah. it right there. I mean, that is it. What is wanted of me? And so every day I try to wake up with that idea in mind. It's not about what I want. It is what is wanted of me from a higher power, right? He's the right. one who's directing me in terms of what I need to be doing on a daily basis. And, you know, what is the end goal? Uh, you know, how can I help this world make it a better place? And I hope that the college students will take that and learn from it and, and do something good with that. 
Um, now we do love good food here at the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I mean, <laughs> I love to eat. Okay, that's my, that's my thing, and I get to Knoxville all the time. What's your favorite restaurant in town? So that way I can go visit. <laughs> uh, we don't have we don't have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> There's got to be one or two. The one the one that is most popular to uh, outside Knoxville people because they often hear about it on game day uh, when they're here uh, promoting a UT football game is uh, Litton's in North Knoxville. I've been there any number of times and don't ever expect to be disappointed. It's just a, a really good, they have burgers, but they have a lot of other stuff. But there's another one that's a, kind of a new one and I know the owner uh, and he's very successful res restaurateur. It's called Southern Grit and it's in the downtown area. Uh, we got a lot of good, uh, Cafe Four is another good one in Market Square, which is fairly well known mm -hmm. outside of Knoxville. Mm -hmm. um so yeah i don't they won't go hungry if they come to town <laughs> that's my kind of town that's why i come to knoxville because i know i'm not going to go hungry that's, that's for right. sure that's right. <laughs> so if our student listeners if they want to pick up your book it's called compassionaries unleash the power of serving or maybe they want you to come and speak at their university about community service where can they go to connect with you to learn more about you and pick up your book the best place is on the website that I have set up uh, in support of the book, davidwcrocker.com. There's a place there for requesting for a speaking engagement. Of course, there's information about the book. I also have some blogs on there. I do a blog every other week and they're all about serving. Uh, they may find something interesting there. But yes, that's that's the best place, best place to go to get it, davidwcrocker.com. I love it. David, you are the community service expert. I hereby make you the expert and uh, it's fantastic what you do. When you told me what you do, you know, I said, wow, finally, I got somebody that's going to talk about the benefits of community service. And I think you've laid it out both for the person who's doing the service and for those who are receiving the service. And uh, boy, oh boy, that's the key to making this world a better place for all those college students that are listening, trying to figure out how to do that. It's through community service with your fraternity or sorority. I promise you, the bonds are going to be greater if you just do that. Um, and so uh, come back and let me know if you think I'm wrong, but I know I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, thank you so much, David. It's been great talking to you today and uh, I wish you all the success in the world. Thank you so much for being on our show. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity, Michael. My pleasure. And to our student listeners right now, I want you to like this video. I want you to share it wide to every fraternity and sorority member on your campus, uh, because what David is talking about is really at the crux of where we need to go as a community going forward. And so I'm just so appreciative. Please share it. Please like it. And we hope to see you on another episode of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Thanks so much for stopping by and we'll see you next time.